It's good to see you tonight and uh, good to participate in this Bible study together. I hope you've been gaining something from the study in the Gospels. This is all four Gospels at once. Tonight is part 65. That means that for 65 Thursdays, uh, we have been involved in this Gospel study together. And we're really only at John chapter 7. Now, in John chapter 7, we, we see the uh, discourse of Christ and the Pharisees at the time of Succoth. And this runs into chapter 10. So from sev chapter 7 to chapter 10, we're going to be reading a discourse uh, that happened at the time of Succoth about six months before uh, Jesus was crucified. So you can see that we're getting close to the crucifixion. But the crucifixion doesn't, doesn't even, the story of the crucifixion in John doesn't even begin until chapter 12. And so uh, once we get to chapter 12, then we begin to see them getting ready for the, for the Last Supper. Uh, John chapter 13, the washing of the disciples' feet. Uh, John chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17 uh, is the discourse at the Last Supper and uh, the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, and then 18 and 19 is the arrest and the crucifixion of Christ. Chapter 20, his resurrection. Chapter 21 uh, seems to be an afterthought that, uh, that uh, John applies to the gospel. But uh, so just to give you kind of an idea of where we are, we're still somewhere in the middle of all of this, but leaning towards uh, the final events but we have not yet gotten to the final events. I have a folder that says final events. This is the later ministry events of uh, Jesus. So it kind of give you an idea of where we are if you're just tuning in and haven't been watching this Bible study series. Hopefully you're learning a lot. That's my goal. My goal is that you really learn uh, from this Bible study and that God is able to take what you're learning and to add that knowledge to your, um, your, your, the degree to which your eyes are opened and your ears are open, so that you be, can begin to see uh, the gospel in practice and begin to practice it in your own life. Hopefully, that's where uh, this will go for you. It's good to see Daryl, good to see Roy, and uh, hoping to see more folks signing in or liking or whatever. And again, I know that there's a few people that take a look at this after uh, it's been broadcast. So let me just say hi to you at the beginning of this. We're going to go ahead and have a word of prayer and then get started, okay? Let's pray. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to be here together and to study the Bible together. We thank you, Lord, for friends all over the United States that tune in and some that occasionally tune in from another country. And we ask God that your hand would be on all that are watching this. And I pray God your hand on them to guide them, to direct them. Lord, this is your Bible. It's not my Bible to turn into what I think it ought to be turned into. And it's not their Bible to hear it in a way that they wish it, it could be heard. But it's incumbent upon them as listeners and as people that maybe ask questions uh, from time to time, and it's incumbent upon me as the speaker to stay out of the way and to let your Bible speak for itself. Help us, I pray, Father, not to tell it what it's allowed to say, either by keeping some of the counsel from the listener or by the listener filtering out those things that they don't like. And I pray, God, that in the end, your name would be honored and your Bible would be glorified for the Word of God truly is Jesus Christ. And here we have uh, all that he embodied written down in letters for us that we might study it and read it and get to know him and the one that sent him. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us to do just that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, glad to see Joe. Hi, Joe. We're going to go ahead and uh, turn to John chapter 7. So let's go ahead and get there now. Uh, 7 through 10, actually some of my favorite passages in the Gospels um, because very, very rich in theology. Now, if you sit in any of my Bible studies outside of the Internet, you know that whenever I say something is rich in theology, 
That means we might get through one, maybe two questions if we're lucky, but that's okay. Part of, part of being expositional in your study is slowing down uh, the reading of the gospel so that you can catch all of the different things and uh, find the definition for them within the scriptures so that as you're defining the scripture with scripture, you're actually growing in your understanding. We're looking at verses 14 to 24, and so starting up at verse uh, 14. Now, uh, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, uh, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? And Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, uh, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh and uh, of himself seeketh his own glory, and he that speaketh his or that seeketh his glory that sent him, uh, that same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? And the people answered and said, Thou hast a devil. Who goeth about to kill thee? Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done the work, and ye will marvel. Moses, therefore, gave you circumcision, though not uh, because it is of Moses, but of the fathers, and ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken. Are ye angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Okay, so we're going to pause there. Now, a couple of interesting things I'm just going to quickly point out. One is that uh, the Jews, now remember here and in other passages in the gospel, whenever it says the Jews said to him, or here the people answered and said, um, it doesn't mean the whole crowd in unison said this thing. It means a spokesman from among the crowd said this thing. Now, if a spokesman, then it would be most likely uh, a Pharisee or a teacher of the law, uh, one of those that w that spoke up. So much of the time, even though it doesn't say specifically the Pharisees said unto him, much of the time it means here when it says the people said or somebody spoke up, um, it said, uh, it, it usually means here that um, that uh, it's it's the Pharisees and even though it doesn't specifically say the Pharisees. Now, they, <laughs> they said, who's trying to kill you? Now, earlier in chapter 7, uh, up around, uh, um, I think just the few verses before it somewhere, my, my eyes aren't focusing real fast here, but uh, they said, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? Uh, so it's interesting, isn't it, that uh, the crowd knew that they were trying to kill Jesus, and the Pharisees lie. They just outright lied. And they said, uh, they said, well, that's, uh, you must have a devil. Who's trying to kill you? <laughs> they were trying to kill him. Uh, it was obvious. Of course, this has been known since early in the Gospels. Uh, it wasn't very long into it that the Herodians and the Pharisees, who hated each other, uh, got together and decided to figure out how they could kill Jesus. And you know that we've talked about it so far that the plot was that he's a Sabbath breaker and that's where they can get him. And so they've been trying to tempt him on the Sabbath to heal. And here he is healed again on the Sabbath. 
And so, uh, having healed again on the Sabbath, now, now they're arguing with him, and he says to them, hey, wait a minute. You guys will circumcise someone on the Sabbath in order to keep the law of Moses. And he so why are you upset with me? I've made somebody every whit whole. I didn't just circumcise them. I, I saved them. I went way beyond circumcision here. So uh, that's kind of the argument here. Now, there's also some interesting theological things here that Jesus says that I think need to be pointed out. But let's stick with the, uh, the questions for the time being. Uh, when did Jesus start teaching during this festival? And where does Jesus' teaching come from? You'll notice he started teaching in the middle of the festival. Uh, he gave it a little bit of time. Uh, while he was walking around and while people were talking to him, he, he really wasn't preaching, but now he goes to the temple in the middle of the festival, not at the beginning. You'll, know, you'll remember what we said. He does not come through the gate because this is Sukkoth. If he came through the gate, whether they understood it or not, it would, it, it would be symbolic of him returning to dwell in the midst of the people, which is what Sukkoth is, a remembrance of the days that God dwelt among them. But now here in the midst of the, uh, of the festival, he comes to the temple. And in a sense, this is him declaring that he is in the midst of them. And uh, the argument that he's being given from the Pharisees, uh, as it were, as spokesmen of the people, is that uh, here he is speaking and who gave him the ability to understand and how is it that he knows letters? Now, that's an interesting question, isn't it? In other words, it's like, how does he know how to read? He didn't have enough money to get go to a school and get taught. Back in that day, you understand, they didn't have public school. And he was from Nazareth, of all places. Can anything good come from Nazareth, as they said? And uh, so it, it's, not, uh, it, it's not like uh, they were being reasonable. They were actually poking fun at him. Uh, they, were, they were saying, how does this guy know how to read? So Jesus, it, knowing what direction they're going with the fun that they're poking... Uh, he, he says, hey, he says, I'm only sharing with you the doctrine I was told to share. And then he makes a statement here. He says, a guy that comes, and I'm going to put it in my own words a little, but a guy that comes and tells you what he was told to tell you is an honorable guy. He's a guy that's doing what is right, and there's no guile found in him. Now, if he were speaking on his own, then yeah, he would be seeking his own glory. But he's, but I'm not speaking on my own. I'm seeking the glory of the one that sent me, and I only speak what he tells me to speak. Now, this is important, okay? Because when we're reading the Gospels, I don't know why, but we skip over all of this stuff that Jesus says here, and we get it in our heads, and a lot of it's because of young pastors who want to be hip, and who want to be cool, you know, hey, Jesus was just figuring this out, and he was smart. Look at how he made those Pharisees look. He really got on top of them and made them look bad. Ha, ha, ha. He really stuck it to the man. Ha, ha, ha. That's not what's going on in the Gospels at all. If anybody's sticking it to the man, it's the Pharisees, because Jesus is the man. Okay, he is the man. He is God. And God himself in the second person has come to live and to dwell among the people. And they esteemed him not. They received him not. They knew him not. And they couldn't recognize him because their eyes were blinded and their ears were dimmed. Now, that is just amazing that that is what uh, is happening here and quietly quietly ever so quietly Jesus didn't come through the gate during Sakoth he waited till the middle he didn't even go to the temple until midway through because his coming when he dwells among his people will be later it's not going to be at this time not in this first coming but in the second coming now, 
all of this is extremely important in understanding what John means in chapter 2, verse 6, when he says that we must live as Christ lived. Now, a lot of moralists have gotten the idea. Now, what is moralism? Well, there, there's different ways of skewing the scripture. One is legalism, and that's the idea that, uh, that, that grace uh, only matters for your inability to, uh, to keep the law, whatever inability you might have, but holds out the idea that, that if man just changes his ways and instead of breaking the law, just keeps the law, that somehow that will make them right with God. Um, that's akin to a man that's already been put in prison and a sentence has already been passed uh, telling you, hey, I'll be good now, I'll be good now. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Your sentence has already been passed. You've been sentenced to death. And you're in jail and you're waiting death. Doesn't matter how good you are on the inside. Now, granted, this isn't American prison that I'm talking about. Because apparently with American prison, if you're really good, even if they give you the death penalty, uh, they very well may just let you go if you're good enough. So that's not right, of course. Uh, and I'm, maybe I'm being a little bit sarcastic here, but um, maybe I'm not. Uh, that being said, why... Uh, legalism is uh, about that same kind of a thing. Now, moralism is akin to legalism. Uh, what moralism is, is that now that I've been saved, I have to prove my worth by maintaining a certain moral code. Now, I'm not saying that you and I aren't, aren't uh, somehow called to uh, uh, some sort of morals, but the morals that we have flow out of Christ. They don't flow out of yours and my ability or inability to be moral or to practice morals. Um, but rather instead, uh, whatever morals you have, they come in the same way that Jesus is talking about here, because you're doing the will of the Father. And since you're doing the will of the Father, you're just moral by default. You're not moral, though, because you're actively trying to be moral in order to maintain some kind of a relationship to Christ, to God or to Christ. So now all of that said, because uh, we have a lot of moralists that will tell you that the idea of living as Jesus did, 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, is uh, that we have to live as perfectly as he did. We have to live as cleanly as he did. We have to live as lawful as he did. We have to live as righteous as he lived. And if we cannot match that level of perfection, why then we are breaking one of the main uh, doctrines. And in breaking one of the main doctrines, you and I then have no assurance of heaven whatsoever if we cannot, at which gave birth at one point, and I don't know at which point, but it gave birth at one point to the idea that if God calls us to that level of perfection, then there must be some second uh, work of grace that uh, takes the imperfect Christian, uh, as they sometimes would call him the carnal Christian, and then turns him into a heavenly Christian and... Uh, eliminates the possibility of sin uh not not even doesn't even eliminate just the practice of sin but even the possibility of sin because they've been given this uh this uh work that they some some of them called sanctification some of them called uh, the second blessing some of them called it the baptism of the holy spirit uh somehow uh there's this there's several movements within the larger movement that uh, that the moralists, having read First John chapter two verse six, believe that what John is trying to say is that there's a level of perfection. But here, what we see, this is John's gospel compared with John's epistle, okay, and we see here that what Christ is saying is that the pattern of his life is a pattern of obedience. And that's the pattern that you and I need to live. Not the pattern of perfection, but the pattern of obedience. Now, the perfection of Christ is there for our salvation. 
being wedded to Christ, betrothed now, but later we will be fully married. But being married to Christ or betrothed to Christ puts us in the position of inheriting through that union the very perfection that God requires. And so in that relationship with Christ, that perfection comes to us, but vicariously. It doesn't, it, it, it's not a perfection that you or I can gin from ourselves and make it work. It doesn't come out of this because the, your, your mind, your soul, and your appetites are completely depraved, according to the scripture. There, you can't trust it. You can't trust your mind. You can't trust your soul. The heart is wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? So we understand then from that verse, and I, I could do a whole diatribe on that, but that's not important or germane to what we're reading right now. But uh, if I was to tell you uh, that you are completely incapable, that is totally depraved means completely incapable of saving yourself, then you, you are either going to throw up your hands and say, well, I really didn't care one way or the other anyways, and you're going to walk off. Or you're going to, taking a look at the importance of salvation, you're going to say, well, then what must I do to be saved? And the answer to that found in uh, the Philippian jailer's story is that you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? Believe he exists? No, that, that's, that doesn't even get there. Now, it's part of the, part of the equation because it does say in, he, in Hebrews 11 and verse 6 that you have to believe that God exists. Okay, and then that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Those are two things, two aspects of faith that uh, the writer of Hebrews illuminates there. But um, it goes beyond, though, when Paul, Paul and Silas said to the Philippian jailer, uh, you, you, know, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is also to believe in his works, to believe in his righteousness, to believe in his holiness, to believe that he is sufficient to save you. And if he is sufficient, then you don't have to add anything to the work that Jesus did to save you. Okay, so the work that Jesus did to save you, being sufficient, you don't need more. You don't need, he doesn't need your help plus what he did in order for you to be saved. Otherwise, he's not sufficient. And the very fact that you believe that, that he requires something of you for salvation other than the work that he did means that you believe in the insufficiency of Jesus Christ and you are practicing it openly and actively proclaiming to everyone that the cross was insufficient, that the scripture is insufficient, that the person of Christ is insufficient, that the work of God is insufficient. And that in of itself uh, harkens back to what's said in Hebrews chapter 6, that if you've been enlightened, you've tasted of the light, and then you turn your back on that and claim the insufficiency of all of it, it's impossible for you to be brought back to repentance because you have this idea in your head that everything that Christ did was for nothing, and you still need to do something for yourself. And the Bible says that's like crucifying Christ all over again and subjecting him to public shame. Okay, he's not insufficient. He's sufficient. Everything that he does, everything that he did, everything that he has done for you is sufficient to save you. So he doesn't need extra help. Now, that being the case, uh, all of that is wrapped up in this idea that what Jesus is doing is obedience and what he's demonstrating is obedience. Now, he sets the pattern for you and I, okay? And that's this phrase, obedience, that comes by faith. Now, you see that at the beginning of Romans and at the end of Romans because that's the theme of Romans, okay? The whole theme of Romans is this obedience that comes by faith. Now, Jesus puts his faith in God the Father. Now you say, well, well, yeah, but he's God the Son, so is that so easy for him? Well, in some sense, yes, but he's still the Son of Man. Okay, the Bible says anyone who denies that Jesus came in the flesh, uh, the, the truth is not in them. 
Uh, and so Jesus did indeed come in the flesh. And he was indeed the son of man. Which means that uh, everything that he did, Hebrews chapter 5 says, he had to learn obedience by what he suffered. Now what does that mean he had to learn obedience by what he suffered? He needs to learn that obedience causes suffering. Why? For your sake and for my sake. Why? Because we have a high priest, chapter 4 of Hebrews, we have a high priest that is not unfamiliar with our plight, but has been tempted in every way that we are yet without sin. Okay? So we understand then from chapters 4 and chapters 5 of Hebrews that Jesus must live by obedience so that he understands that what the calling is on our life to be obedient so that, so that not only do we see his suffering and understand that obedience is going to mean suffering for us, but so that he learns suffering so that when we suffer, he's not unfamiliar with our suffering. Okay, so, so all of this wrapped up, and like I said, there's a lot of theology here, and all of this wrapped up in this statement where Jesus, who arguably could have been speaking for himself, says plainly, I've never been speaking for myself. I've only been telling you what God the Father told me to tell you. Now, that's incredible because most of us have grown up with fellows that have preached to us and taught us that, and even I was guilty of it in my early days as a pastor. Sure, I was. Why? Because I was imitating the pastors before me. And because I, how would I know what to do? You know, I mean, I mean, I'd, all I knew was what I had seen and what I had heard and what I had learned and what people had taught me until about 1998 when God began to teach me. And uh, don't get me wrong, I've not been perfect and I've never been perfect. And I still am not perfect. Uh, ask my wife. She knows. <laughs> Just, just don't ask too many questions. She, she won't tell you. Hopefully, won't tell you some of the things. Oh well. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> um, the the point being here that uh, that God working in our lives, uh, he he really uh, teaches us the pattern of obedience, and that's what it means. Anyone who claims to walk with God must live as Jesus did. That's what it means. It means live in obedience. Not live morally perfect, not live legally perfect. Jesus did all of that for you already. So if you're joined to him, the two become one flesh. You're joined to him. Why, all of that's already taken care of. The, perf the perfection of legal, the perfection of the moral, the perfection of the righteous, the holiness, all of that is taken care of. It's yours in Christ. Okay, but out of Christ, it's not yours. It's yours in Christ. Okay, all of this said, because of this statement that he makes, very important statement. Okay, hopefully you're taking notes or mental notes or physical notes on this because I can't emphasize this enough because no matter how many times I point this out to folks, folks still come back at me and talk to me like, like it's all about, you know, well, God told us to do this thing, and now it's up to me to figure out how to fulfill that. You know, it's uh, these people that read in John 17 that Jesus prayed for unity. Well, it's up to us to answer that prayer. He wasn't praying to us. He was praying to the Father. It's up to the Father to answer that prayer. <coughs> so how in the world do we even participate in that except through obedience? Do what God tells you to do. Live for the Lord. Make him number one in your life. And Christ will be our unity. We don't need to unify our tastes and our flavors and our, and our interests and our passions and all of that. We don't need to do that. Just be unified on Christ. And enjoy the fact that we all have different tastes and different backgrounds and different this and different that. That's okay. It just makes us a more complete body. That's fine, you know. Uh, Paul says it this way, right? Should the eye say to the, or should the foot say to the eye? Because I'm not an eye, I don't belong. Of course not. Of course not. 
Well, anyways, we're going to move on. So let's move on to the next question, starting up at uh, verse 25, going down through verse 31. Then said some of them at Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? Oh, that's where it is, down there, not up before. But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers uh, know indeed that this is the very Christ? How be it we know this man whence he is? But when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then said Jesus to the tem in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, uh, and ye know whence I am. And I am not, uh, I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not, but I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. And many in see many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which uh, which this man hath done? And are we going to thirty two? Just thirty one, okay. So we're gonna pause there. Now let's take a look at what we see happening here in the crowd. Okay. Uh, first of all, they know that they know that the Pharisees are trying to kill him. It's well known among them. The Pharisees were like, oh, you know, we just said that earlier. I don't need to go through that again. What are the two sides of the controversy in the crowd? Well, one of the sides of the controversy is we know him. We know where he comes from. The, fair, the, the teachers of the law have always taught us that when the Messiah comes, he's just going to appear in the temple. Uh, he's just going to just appear there. Well, here Jesus is appearing in the temple, but they know where he came from. So uh, those that believe in this particular uh, teaching, uh, they're having a hard time with the fact that they know that uh, he's from Nazareth. And then the others are like, well, yeah, but if the Christ did come, if it wasn't him, would, the, would another Christ do more miracles than what this fellow has done? So there was definitely a division within the, uh, the crowd. Now, uh, again, in the crowd, there may have been people talking, but it's not like a whole group of people talking in unison and a whole group of people talking in unison. Again, when they say the crowd, uh, sometimes what they mean is leaders in the crowd, spokesmen in the crowd, um, or it may mean that that is a general opinion that's being voiced in the crowd somewhere. Uh, a majority of the time, it means one of the teachers of the law. So this very dispute may have been between teachers of the law. Uh, not only uh, not only this dispute, but the comments of the crowd, which started out this whole discussion, which were, isn't this the guy they're trying to kill? Uh, you know, is it? Do they know then that he is the Christ? Because they're not saying anything to him. And so the, the, uh, this particular uh, discussion evolves. Now Jesus makes another statement, yet another statement, about who he is, about what he does, about his mission, about how he functions as the second person of the Trinity. Now let's talk a little bit about the second person of the Trinity here so that we can kind of reiterate some of this for people that either have heard me teach on this or people that have not heard and could use this to understand. In, in the Trinity of God, uh, the God, God is the Father at the top, the Son and the Holy Spirit, okay? Now the Father is at the top because just like your Trinity, you're made in God's image. That means you're a Trinitarian being. That does not mean God has physical features like you do. Now, he does use personification so that you can kind of get an idea of what he means. When he says, is my arm too short? Uh, when he says, I hold this in my hand, he's using 
uh, personification because the Bible says clearly God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so that statement alone, uh, coupled with the rest of the scripture, makes it clear to us that uh, we're talking about uh, a spiritual God. We're not talking about a physical God. Um, that being said, uh, you've been made in his image. You're Trinitarian. At the top of your triangle is your mind and then your body and then your soul. Okay. Now your, your body holds the position that Christ holds. Uh, as it says in uh, chapter 10, sacrifice and uh, offering and sacrifice you did not desire, but a body you gave me. Uh, that's Hebrews chapter 10. It's reiterating something that was said uh, in the Old Testament. And so we understand then that he's also, Hebrews 1, 3, the exact representation and manifestation of the Godhead. And so he represents, he's the physical representation of the invisible parts of God. The mind of God is invisible, uh, that is the Father, and the soul of God, that is the Holy Spirit, is invisible. And the body of God is Jesus Christ. He is the manifestation. Just like your own body manifests the invisible parts of you. Your soul is invisible. Your mind is invisible. We know that there's a brain up here and that's where kind of the mind is functioning physically. That's fine. That's fine. But uh, the lay a brain out on the table and you have no idea whatever has been stored in that brain or whatever that brain has ever thought. It, it, it can't physically manifest itself by itself. It requires a body to do that. So even if you are saying to, you, saying to me or hollering at the screen on the other side, you know, hey, come on now, the mind is, that's just the brain. No, the brain is not the mind. The brain is the physical organ that you have that houses the mind. But the mind is an invisible part of you. Just like the Father is invisible and the Holy Spirit is invisible, but Jesus is visible. Jesus says to Philip and to Thomas in John chapter 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father because there is no other manifestation of the Father but Christ. Okay, so all of this said, why? Because while Christ may be the second person of the Trinity, he is the manifestation of God. So when he says that the one who sent him is God and that he knows the one because he's been with the one, he's speaking as if you might say to somebody, hey, I know what I'm thinking. I know my mind. I know my own thoughts. How do you know what I'm thinking? Okay, it's that same sense of what Jesus is saying here but because the three persons of the Trinity are separate and distinct persons, he speaks about the Father in the second person uh, or even the third person sometimes. And uh, that doesn't mean, though, that he's not, as the Son of God, part of the Godhead. Sure, he is. But that's the spirit that inhabits this body. And the body that we have here is the body Jesus, which is 100% man. And the spirit of the man is 100% God. That is the, the son of God or the second person of the Trinity uh, directly inhabiting this person in some fashion, this, this personage in some fashion. Okay. So when Jesus says that he's been sent by the Father and that he knows the Father and the Father knows him, he's making a statement that, of, of intimacy that is way, way beyond just simply saying, like the prophets might have said, that God revealed himself to them, that God gave them a command, and that they're only telling them what God told them to tell them. Now, in the, there's a sense in which Jesus and the prophets have a kinship because they have been sent as messengers to share the message of the one that sent them. But there's a sense in which Jesus is superior to the prophets because the prophets had to be, uh, they, they had to have God revealed to them. They had to have God made manifest to them in some fashion, which would have been through Christ. 
And so therefore, when, when uh, Isaiah, for instance, in chapter 6, when he sees the Lord standing in the temple and the train of his robe fills the temple, this manifestation could be none other than the manifestation of God himself, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus. So in a sense, then, we, we would see uh, through the body of Scripture that it's Jesus that, that Isaiah sees uh, in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 6, even though at this point you would only say the second person of the Trinity, for the Son of Man has not yet been born into existence, but he was uh, intended in existence, and he was planned into existence from the foundation of the earth. And I know that maybe this seems a little con convoluted to you. I'm just simply reporting what the scripture is telling us. Okay, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he was the same before the creation of the world, the same during the, the timeline of the world, and he'll be the same after this world is gone. And he's not changing as time goes on. He's not developing Okay, so his knowledge of the Father is, is an intimate knowledge beyond what you or I could even begin to understand because he is part of the Godhead. And so when he makes this statement to the Pharisees, if they understood what he was saying and who it was that was saying it to them, they would have shut their mouths and they would have trembled in fear, maybe even wet themselves a little bit, because of their fright and their fear of who it was that stood before them, but because he was veiled in flesh as the Son of Man and was touchable and reachable, seeable, and uh, could be, uh, his hand could be shaken, uh, his back could be padded, uh, he could be uh, seized later on and put in prison later on if if, uh, if, if you consider the house of, of Pilate or the house of Herod as sort of a prison, um, he could be killed. Uh, and uh, God raised him from the dead, though. Uh, so there was a power that came through that was not the power of the prophets. Many of the prophets were killed, but none of them ever raised from the dead on their own. But this Jesus did. Now, all of this having been said, it's really important for us to understand who Jesus is, how he functions, what he does, why he does it, because I have to, because there's so much out there of people that say that the Bible is a tool that God gave us to do his will. And Jesus says that he is the word the living word. So these words here that live, although printed on paper, these words here comprise the very manifestation that we have of Christ himself. And so we read these holy words and we cannot deviate from them. If we deviate from them, we're really in trouble. We have to be careful. Okay, sufficiency of scripture, that's one of the main issues there. Um, now, all of this being said, because we are trying to get to the core of Christian living, which is obedience. And obedience does not include invention. Invention is actually the antithesis of obedience. To give you an example, I tell my child, uh, hey, could you go to my toolbox and get me the screwdriver? And he knows what a screwdriver is. That's, that's a precedent for this particular uh, illustration. But he goes to the toolbox and instead he says to himself, you know, I, I think that he could do a lot better with a hammer. And so uh, he inventively, uh, out of a good heart, wanting to help me, gets a hammer instead. Well, he didn't obey me. Uh, even though he was trying to help me to do my job and was trying to help me to get done what he needed, what I needed to get done, 
he didn't just obey me. If he had just obeyed me, everything would be fine. But now I have to correct him. Now he has to go back and he has to either obey me again or else he's going to be inventive again. But when God says through Jesus, I will build my church and then churches sit down in the planning room and plan out how it is they're going to fulfill the command of God with their inventiveness, what kind of a building they want to have, what kind of a program they want to have, what kind of a, of a demographic they want to reach and all these other crazy things that happen. Um, instead of just building a building that meets the needs of the congregation and being simple, uh, instead we, we have all these complicated, complex buildings uh, full and full of, of rooms and activities, and the pastors are high-powered, and, and uh, the influence is high, and then all of a sudden, one day, you find out that because he's so arrogant and so full of himself, that he's either uh, misappropriated funds or has treated a young lady in the congregation improperly, and the next thing you know, the church is splitting the plant is is uh, miles underwater. And the next thing you know, why it has to be mortgaged and the whole church is broken. Uh, that's the kind of story that has happened over and over and over again because of a failure to be obedient. Now, I'm not saying that an obedient church can't wind up being a big church. But if it does wind up being a big church, it should be out of obedience that it gets there. And it should stay there out of obedience. Otherwise, if invention enters into it at all, we're in trouble. For it says in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 25, When you build an altar, do not make it out of dressed stone or you will corrupt it. So in laying a chisel even to what God is doing on his own is corruption. Uh, you do not build uh, the altar to the Lord out of dressed stone. You don't need to refine the plans of God. Well, surprisingly enough, we're actually going to make it to question three. So um, looking at verses 32 to 36 now. The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such um, uh, such things concerning him and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? Uh, what, see, what manner of saying is this that he said, Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, whither ye cannot come. So, here in this particular section, Jesus is saying to them something about his crucifixion and his death and his ascension and resurrection and ascension. Um, he is talking about returning to the right hand of the Father and is telling the people they can't go there. That won't, they, they won't find him. Where is Jesus going that they cannot go? Well, uh, the again, the nature of Jesus being that he is the Son of Man and the Son of God uh, means that with regards to us, he's the Son of Man. With regards to the Godhead, he's the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. When he returns to heaven, uh, Christ sits down at the right hand of the Father and takes his authority uh, that God has given him. But as it says in the scripture, sit here until I make your enemies your footstool. So we understand that during this time that you and I are living through right now, 
God the Father is under the process of making all of Christ's enemies his footstool. Um, so there is a process going on. There is activity going on. And God is busy in that activity <clears throat> to bring about uh, a result. And that result being that Christ's enemies are going to be made into his footstool. Um, that is uh, that God is going to put everything under his feet. Now, it's interesting that the scripture also says that God has put everything under his feet, and then it follows it up right there and says, uh, we, now we don't see it at this time as put under his feet, but that's God's determination. It, essentially what the scripture is saying is that's God's determination and it will happen. Uh, everything that God has determined to do, it will happen. Everything that God has determined to come to pass, it will come to pass. Uh, have no doubt about that in your mind. Uh, you cannot have faith in the Lord if you believe that the Lord makes mistakes or might make mistakes or might not understand or might not get it or whatever. You, you have no faith in God then, if that's the case. Because the Bible says that he who asks must believe and not doubt, for he who doubts is like a reed swayed in the wind. Uh, you cannot doubt the Lord on these things. But uh, it's also important that you're uh, not coming to faith in something that's not supported in Scripture and then not doubting that it's ever going to not come to pass. Because if you believe, for instance, the uh, Word of Faith movement, which also often will uh, say to a person, all you got to do is just figure out what it is you want for your life, name it, claim it, pray it, mark it, park it, whatever, <laughs> and it'll be done. And somebody says, says, all right, I believe that. I believe that with all my heart, and I have no doubt whatsoever. And somebody comes along and says, you don't really believe that name it and claim it business. Oh, I sure do. I sure do. Oh, I'm not going to I'm not gonna give that up. I'm not going to, to doubt that. I'm not going to let you tempt me away from my faith. Well, now we're in a, in a problem because somebody has now come to believe in something that's not true. And not only that, but it's so appealing to them that the idea of letting go of it just just is uh, beyond uh, re reprehensible to them. And so then we have a real problem there. Well, strangely enough, that question was so pithy that uh, I really am going to move on. Uh, we, we still have, it's a total of two pages though, so it's not like we're going to get rid of it all tonight in one fell swoop. Um, looking at John 7, verses 37 to 43. 37 to 43. In the last day, in the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, uh, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Uh, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they knew which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Uh, many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Now they're referring back to Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Well, they've missed the point because it does say that in Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? You notice here that they've missed the fact that he was born in Bethlehem of Judea because he was of David's line. So there was a discussion, a division among the people because of him. Okay, so pausing there and moving on. Why wait until the last day of Succoth? Because he was not going to come and dwell with them. Now, he's referring back to, um, I think it's Isaiah 55, Oh, if anyone is thirsty, come by and eat uh, food without price and such and such. And uh, he's referring back to that when he says, if anyone's thirsty, come after me. 
Um, the idea being, okay, we're at the end of Sukkoth. You celebrated that in the past I dwelt among you. So if you're thirsty and really want this to happen, come to me now. Come to me now and I will dwell not just in the midst of us, but in the midst of the person. So God, if you've been saved, God has given you the Holy Spirit. This is what John means when he says he spoke of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Ghost had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Okay, that's what he means. So it's one thing for Sakoth to mean God dwelt in the camp, but it's another thing here for this message at Sakoth to say that God wants to dwell in the person, wants to dwell in you, in me, you. And that's, uh, that's something else to, uh, to be uh, in that position and to experience that. Are the prophet and the Messiah different people? Well, no, but they were taught that they were. Um, the, the Jewish people were taught that that there was a prophet, but then there was also a Messiah, that the prophet would be the prophet for the Messiah uh, on the behalf of the Messiah. Um, but they failed to understand that the prophet and the Messiah are indeed the same person, Jesus Christ. Uh, what did the crowd not know and how could they have not known it? Well, um, what they didn't know was the identity of Christ, and that is that he was born in Bethlehem. He was of the line of David. Uh, the king in Isaiah 9 does come through Galilee. Uh, all of these things are there, and they're all present in the scripture. But what had happened over time was that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in the past, between Ezra's time and the present time, they had begun to create for themselves a teaching about the Messiah that they recorded in what's known as the Talmud. And they began to preach the Talmud instead of preaching the scriptures. They didn't go back to the scriptures. They went back to the teachings of the ancient Pharisees. And because the ancient Pharisees had taught that the Messiah and the prophet were different people, that the Messiah would just appear in the temple and all of these kinds of things. That was the teaching that they always taught. They didn't go to the scripture to know them for themselves. They went to the scripture only as recitation, and they only went to the scripture in so much as uh, they needed it for some kind of uh, religious exercise in their liturgy. And so um, the teaching, though, that they gave was consistent with the teaching of the, of the Talmud. And so the people were barred from, even the Pharisees and the Sadducees were barred from understanding and knowing it because they just, they, they had no, no further curiosity and in some ways they were discouraged from having any further curiosity uh, than to know what the Talmud had to say about the scripture. Once they knew what the Talmud had to say, that was it. It was a done deal. It was over with. Uh, and there was, there was no looking at the scripture and introducing controversy, uh, disagreeing with the Talmud, disagreeing with the ancient teachings. Uh, the Catholics have the same problem. Uh, they teach what the early church fathers taught. Uh, but they don't teach uh, from the scripture immediately. Uh, they rather rather teach uh, using the scripture as part of the liturgy, uh, but then uh, they teach what the early church fathers taught. In some fashion, mod the modern reform movement is having a bit of a problem there because although the scripture speaks today, the modern reform movement has a tendency to go back to what the reformers wrote and teach that rather than teaching from the scripture. Now, don't get me wrong. In every case, uh, it's important to research. It's important for the Pharisees to research the Talmud. It's important for the Catholics to research 
the uh, the early church fathers. It's important for modern Reformation movement to research the reformers, and wherever they get it right, according to the scripture, keep it. Why not keep it if they got it right? But if they got it wrong, and you see an obvious place where where the, it could be refined or it could be uh, it could be touched up, um, the each of these groups would say that it's the height of arrogance for a modern pastor to read the scripture, then read what the earlier church fathers or the reformers or whatever wrote, and then disagree with it. Now, I'm not saying that it's safe to go and take the scripture and completely reorder it. In fact, most of everything that I teach, there's there, there are reformers that wrote these things. I didn't know that. Let me say this very clearly, okay? You may think that I teach Calvinism. I have no idea if I do. I've never read anything by Calvin. I have no idea what he wrote. I've never read the Institutes. I've never read any of that stuff. I have no idea. I'm just trying to be biblical. Maybe someday I'll read Calvin. I don't know. But I'm just saying that if you think I'm teaching Calvinism, I can't possibly be teaching Calvinism because I've never read Calvin. I have no idea. I've not even read John Wesley, really. I, I, if I report anything about Calvin or about Wesley, I'm really just reporting the things that I've heard over the years and the things that I've learned over the years. I'm more concerned with the scripture. There's, there's so much to study within these pages. There's so much to study here. I don't have time to go outside of it and pay attention to what other men have studied. What I have time to do is to read this and occasionally I might read another book and usually what I find is, yeah, yeah, I saw that too. Yeah, I read that too. Yeah, well, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's something else when you're reading through Jonathan Edwards' sermons like I am right now and you're going, you're going wow, yeah, yeah, Jonathan Edwards got that right. <laughs> You know, like, who am I? I'd not to, you know, to sit in judgment on Jonathan Edwards, probably a much better student of the Bible than I ever will be. But I'm not sitting in judgment on him. I, I, I see something that he said. And I say, yeah, I've seen that before too. Yeah, I've read that before too. And that's great when you see that the reformers uh, back up what it is that you've already been taught through the scriptures. That's fine. But if you don't understand the scriptures, and so you go back to the reformers, and you just preach what the reformers taught because you yourself don't understand the scriptures, something is wrong. And this is exactly what Jesus is trying to allude to here. That there, here, are, here are all of these things that are taught in the scriptures, but they've been kept from the people because they were scriptures that the Talmud writers didn't understand. They didn't get it. They didn't know. Of course not, because they were, they were revealed in these days. They weren't revealed in the past. And so because of that, um, these people don't know all of these things. They're saying, hey, wasn't, isn't that, isn't, you know. And in the same way, folks, if we continue as the modern church, if we continue to skip over all of the bad stuff in the Bible, the judgments of God, the warnings of God, the curses of God, all of the negative stuff, if we continue to jump past that and jump past it and jump past it, there's going to come a generation that's going to say, you never told me. We didn't know. We had no idea. I mean, you can convince the whole world that they're saved, but the Bible declares they're not. And one of these days, there is going to be some kind of a worldwide Christianity type of religion. And there's going to be a whole lot of people convinced that they're saved and they're going to be very surprised and angry when Jesus comes back. And when, as the scripture says, uh, there are plagues and judgments passed out on the earth in that day. Um, it's very, 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 necessary uh, for us to be completely open and honest about the scripture. Um, and 
reading Sherry's uh, comment there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the sound was up. That's cute. Okay. Well, let's have prayer. Thank you, everybody. God, we thank you and we love you. We praise you, Lord, for the word. We praise you, Father, for not just its encouragements, but its corrections as well. We praise you, Lord, not just for its positive things and its loving things and its kind things, but we praise you, Lord, for all the sternness and for all the warnings and for all of the discipline that you deliver to us. Lord, we love all of it. We love you. That's why. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us to follow you faithfully and honestly in everything that we do in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, thank you again. And I'll, uh, I'll reread the, uh, the comments again probably a little later because I don't think I really had time to. And I hate to do that in front of everybody unless there's a question. So uh, we'll talk to you later. Everybody have a good week. Um, if you're here locally, don't forget camp meeting starts Monday night at 7 o'clock. And we're going to have a whole week of really great messages and uh, really solid soul searching stuff. So uh, don't forget that, okay? Thanks. Uh, God bless.